in this example, we're going to make things a little bit messier. We're going to be putting a while loop inside of a for loop and seeing how that affects things. So the very innermost part of this here takes constant time. Let's analyze that while loop. To do that, we're going to create an iteration table. And our variable this time, we need to be careful, is j for the while loop. We only create the iteration table for the while loop. j starts at 1, and we're updating j by continually multiplying by 2. So after one iteration, it's 2. After two iterations, it's 4. After k iterations, it is 2 to the k. When does this terminate? Well, this stops when our expression for j, 2 to the k, is equal to the stopping condition of the while loop, which is n. We're going to solve for k. We can solve for k by taking a log base 2 of both sides. So we have k equals log base 2 of n. Now, we're going to try to do this more quickly than we might have when we were studying just the while loops on its own. This code snippet here, lines 4 through 8, takes c log base 2 of n time. So for the for loop, we want to express this as a summation. The cost of each run of that for loop would be c log base 2 of n. So the for loop, t of n, the rest of the runtime for the entire algorithm, is the sum from i equals 1 to n of c log base 2 of n. And now, that's a very easy summation because our summation index, i, does not appear inside of the summation. We're adding up a fixed thing, c log base 2 of n, a fixed number of times, n times. So this is equal to, we have n copies of c log n, so this is c n log base 2 of n. So t of n is in theta of n log n. This example was as easy as they come because our summation index did not appear inside of the summation. So this can be made much worse by adding that sort of wrinkle into things.